good morning. It is good to see uh, the faces that are in the room. Good morning to our folks who are joining us online. Thanks so much for being a part of our day today. Just a couple announcements. I know a few folks came into the room after I had made the, an initial announcement. We are receiving that special offering today. You're welcome to just put it there at the giving station. Just be sure to label that uh, as the special Christmas offering so when our counters count, they'll know the difference between the two. If you are using Simple Give, there is a drop-down menu that you can choose from that would allow you to choose the special Christmas offering and then whatever you give would go directly uh, towards that offering. Just a couple other announcements to call to your attention. Um, we are back meeting in person. We are grateful that our color for the county has gone backwards to uh, red from purple, so we're grateful for uh, God's provision there. We are back to meeting with whomever will come. And uh, we realize that uh, it's an it's a up and down time. We really don't have any clear pictures of how it's all going to shape it. Certainly, we want you to be safe, we want you to be healthy, so if you are feeling in any way, shape, or form uncomfortable about being here, we certainly understand that. We'll continue to live stream for our folks who are joining us online. Nothing is going to change there. We'll continue to live stream for you so that you'll always see that. But we are back meeting both Sunday morning for Sunday school with Danny Faith's class here. Also going to let you know that if you would like to be part of the other Sunday school class that is meeting for adults, Linda Martell is kind of the contact person, or Sonny Eskridge would be the other. If you'd like to be a part of that, you're welcome to give a call to them. If you need their number, just message me or contact me, and I'll pass off the, the information to you so you can join that Zoom Sunday school class. Or Danny's class will meet here at the church at 930. Typically, we'll be meeting on Wednesday night, but this Wednesday night is the day before Christmas Eve, so there'll be no Wednesday night service here, because we'll meet at 6.30 for Christmas Eve here in the Family Life Center. We have some special things in store for you, for folks that are not able to join. I'm excited to, to have that happen, and so I don't want to give away too much of the secrets, but uh, I'm looking forward to a way that we can be together here on Christmas Eve. I saw a few posts over the weekend, and there is still time to do it. We have a few folks that went out and carol to others over uh, the close of the weekend, and really exciting to see, but on that table, as you come in the Family Life Center entrance, there are caroling packs. If you'd like to do that, you want to go out sometime this week with your family or with a, a few close friends and go carol with some folks, we want to encourage you to do that. It's a great way that you can spend less time for yourself and give more to others in this Christmas season, so I just want to encourage you to do that. Lastly, they are not in the room, but I want to voice this expression of appreciation to them, and so the next time you see them yourself, you can say something as well. Tom Nolan uh, is the person here at the church that takes his summers and volunteers uh, free of charge to the church to keep our grounds looking good by mowing the grass and all the things that are part of that. And in the wintertime, he plows our parking and makes sure that things are safe and good for us. And as a church, we want to say thank you to him. And so I have a card of appreciation, a special gift for Tom. But when you see him next, would you just express your thanks to him for all that he does in giving to the church and the work of the kingdom uh, through that groundskeeping? I also want to say to uh, one other person, Terry Crowder. Terry was the person that spent a good bit of the spring and of the summer painting a large portion of the entryway up on the other side of the building. Uh, Terry gave of his time, he gave of his own resources to buy paint and supplies, has painted the entry, painted the hallway, started the paint going down the stairs, will be doing some additional painting for us, painted the entryway here in the Family Life Center. I have a card and a special gift of appreciation for Terry, I just want to encourage you to express your appreciation to him as well. Well, today marks the fourth Sunday of Advent in our journey together. And I'm just going to ask if you would stand with me this morning. And would you just quiet your heart and your mind and your spirit before the Lord. And let's just ask his blessing on our time together. Father God, we thank you for today. We are grateful for all that you have given to us. Lord, I am especially grateful for the opportunity we have to be together uh, those who are here not only in this room, but those who are joining us online. Father, I pray that your spirit would just be present wherever we find ourselves today. 
wherever folks find themselves, whether they watch this video live or whether they watch it at some later date. Lord, would your presence be near to them? Would you deepen their experience of this season of Advent through the time that we spend together? And Lord God, may you receive all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you remain standing as we just worship and give thanks to the Lord for the gift of his Son? Represents the coming 
of the light, which is Christ himself. John chapter 1 tells us that he is the true light coming into the world. And as we draw closer to his coming, we think of that light growing ever brighter as we approach his presence. So let's just continue to worship him, to give him thanks and praise him. You don't know this song? The chorus is pretty easy to pick up, so I'll just invite you to join us when we get there.
You see, when it comes to expressing love, I love how Amy Carmichael phrases this. She says, you can give without love. You can give without love, and I can give gifts to people all over the place, but not have love in my heart for them. But I cannot love without giving. I cannot love without giving. I can give without love, but I cannot love without giving. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to radically love others because we have personally experienced the radical love of God in Jesus Christ. His love changes my heart, it changes your heart, and it should change then the way that we celebrate Christmas. So as we begin today in this sermon, I want to begin like I began last week, which is a little bit of a theological foundation for things. The truth is God loves. God loves. But like I said last week, I suggest to you that our, not only our understanding of giving and how we practice giving, but how we practice loving is shaped more by the culture around us many times than it is by God himself and his word. And so I think it's important as we begin today to lay a theological foundation for this idea that God loves. Much of, if not most, of human love in general is based on external things, on temporary things, on often fickle things. My love for somebody could be based on whether well, they happen to like the same things that I do. And when they stop liking the same things that I do, I'm not going to love them as much or at all. Maybe my love for somebody might be based on whether they love me back. And if I perceive that they do not love me back, even to the same degree that I love them, well, then my love fades for them. A lot of worldly love is based on appearance. Wendy may still look as beautiful as she did the day that we got married, but over the last 30 or so years, I do not look quite as attractive as I did then. Everybody in this room, as we grow older, we do not maintain the same level of physical appearance. If our love is based on something as temporary as that, it is a poor love. But God's love is not based on these things. God's love is not based on these things. If you have a Bible, those watching online today, if you have a Bible, you want to turn with me. We're going to go to the Apostle John's writing to the church. We're going to go to the book of 1 John, almost to the end of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. They are short books, so if you're paging through, it's easy to skip over 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, because in your Bible, they may only be about a page to a page and a half, and maybe a couple pages of this. But in 1 John, chapter 4, we're going to read some important words that underline for us or lay out for us this foundation that God loves. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7 of chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord, church. John says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives, or whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us, so on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him, we can have confidence. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears is not made perfect or complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Important truth today for us. God loves. Love, according to John in his writing here, he shares with us that just as God gives, we talked about that last week, God loves as a part of his character and his nature. Here we look at those first two verses, 7 and 8, in John chapter 4. It says, love comes from God. That word comes from actually implies love has its origin in God. Love isn't something that's just out there. Love isn't something that you and I somehow work up. Love actually has its origins, its foundations in God himself. And then we also read that God is love. Yes, God loves. He displays love, but he actually is love. That displaying of love comes because it is a part of his character in his nature. God's love doesn't rise and fall on our appearance, on our behavior. And even on our ability to reciprocate God's love. There is nothing that you and I can do today, you in the room, or you watching online. There is absolutely nothing that you and I can do today that would cause God to love us more or love us less. Why do I say that? Because God is love. If there was something that you and I could do that would make God not love us, then he would cease to be God. He would be just as fickle and as temporary as you and I, and that would make him not God. God is love. Love comes from him. God doesn't have to make a choice to love me. He doesn't have to somehow work up some kind of energy or motivation to love me. He loves because it is who he is. Not only does God love, but God loves all. For to look into our text, we'd see in verse 9 these words. Verse 9, this is how we know, or this is how God showed his love among us. He sends his one and only son only to a certain set of people, only to the best of the best. Is that what John says? No, he says that God sent his son into the world. We talked about it last week, John 3.16, a verse that most of us memorized from our, the earliest days of our faith. God so loved the world. God loves all. But God is not just some kindly grandparent that overlooks the sins of his children or grandchildren. God doesn't wink at the sin of the world when I say that God loves all. Because if we are to read farther into our text, go right to verse 10. He sent his one and only son into the world so we might live through him. Verse 10 says this, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. We can look at verse 14 and it says this, we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. You see, God's love is the solution to the problem of sin, your sin and my sin, the solution to the problem of the sin of the world. God loves all, but he is not content to leave us lost and dead in our sin. He sends his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. I love the way Paul phrases it in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2. We hear these words. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace, you can say, God sends his Son as an act of love, because he loves all, that we might be saved through him. Noted author J.R. Packer says this, the Christmas message is that there is hope for ruined humanity. 
hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory. Because of the Father's will, Jesus became poor, was born in a stable, so that 33 years later he might hang on the cross for your sin and mine. Why? Because God loves all. The scriptures are very clear. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. God loves every person who has ever been born. Today, if you know the love of God, I would just love for you to affirm that today. And online folks, you can do this by typing in the chat. If you know the saving, redeeming love of Jesus Christ, would you just simply say amen to me? Yes. And if there is anyone today, here, either in this room or anyone that is watching online that has never come to know the saving, redeeming love of Jesus Christ, I'd love to connect with you in a way that can help you experience that. This Christmas season. There can be no greater gift that you'll ever receive than the love of Jesus Christ. God loves because He is love. Love comes from Him. He loves all, but then we, as followers of Christ, are called to love. We are called to love. Our ability to love comes from God. Again, going back to our text. Let's pick it back up where we begin. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Later in the text, we read that we love because he first loved us. Our ability to love comes out of our relationship with him. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Pastor Todd, there are not a lot of unsaved people that seem to be able to love others. Sometimes, sadly, there are unsaved people, people apart from Jesus Christ, who actually do a little bit better job of showing love than we name the name of Christ as his followers. How is that possible? Every person ever born in this world has been made in the image of God. You and I were made in the image of God. Any ability that we have to express love, even apart from a saving relationship with him, comes because we were created in his image. There is this kind of echo of Eden, one author says, that we are able to practice every now and then measures of love, even apart from him. But to truly love as God loves, that only comes when we are in a relationship with him. Because you and I, we are selfish by sinful nature. And our love ultimately will always turn inward. Even in a marriage relationship, apart from Jesus' work in us, our love will turn inward and turn selfish. The kind of love that God loves with, the kind of love that you and I are called to, is agape love, a divine, sacrificial love that runs contrary to culture around us, it runs contrary to our humanness, our self-centered nature. The kind of love that you and I are called to only comes through his transforming power in your life. We need Jesus to love as God has called us to love. We're called to love. The disciples of Jesus Christ, love is a command, and it is a mark of our walk with him. Again, back to our text today. Verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God. If you do not display this agape love, this divine sacrificial love, that is not a mark of your life, and you're not living a life-giving relationship with him. Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's a command. It's a calling for us to love. We could go to verse 16 in the second half of verse 16. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. It should be a mark of our walk with Christ to love as God loves. We can go to verse 20 and 21. Anyone who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This should be a mark of my life and your life. We are called to love. 
And so, as I have been doing over these past weeks together, I have one last what if question for us. What if you and I love all? What if you and I loved all? And how can we flesh that out? Well, what if you and I loved all of our family? What if you and I loved all of our family? God has loved us, warts and all, with all of our frailties, with all of our struggles. We have members of our family who are just as frail and prone to struggle as we are. What if you and I practice love in our family? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. We read it in weddings, but it applies to all of life. What if you and I in our family, our immediate family, with our spouse, with our children, maybe it's with that extended family, with our grandparents, our siblings who are grown and out of the house. Maybe you have a family that has some black sheep who are just hard to love. They're cantankerous. Every time they come to a family function, they seem to stir up discontent rather than a wonderful feeling. What if you love them with 1 Corinthians 13 and above? Jesus says that we're to love our enemies, and sometimes it seems like our enemies are in love. What if you love your family as God demonstrated his love for us? God cares deeply about families. Isaiah chapter 9, that passage that speaks of Jesus is coming, says that he is the everlasting Father. God cares about families. God loves families, and he wants families to live out an expression of his love. In fact, as the family goes, so goes the church. The, the, the biological family is just a microcosm of what the church should be like. So here's an engagement question for you today. What will you do this season and in the coming year to better express God's love to your family? You don't have to answer it. It's more of a rhetorical question, but I want you to ponder that for a minute. What can you do this Christmas season and in 2021 to love your family better, to love all of your family? Perhaps even the ones who disappoint you the most. But not only what if we loved all of our family, what if we loved all of the family God? What if we loved all of the family of God? Sadly, over the course of this election cycle, sadly, over the course of this pandemic season, I have seen brothers and sisters in the faith express some of the most unloving things to one another. They have said some of the most hurtful and hateful things about each other because they are on different sides of the political aisle. They're on differing sides of masks or no masks. Should we always be for service or is there an appropriate time for us to step away because of the pandemic? And they say hurtful things to one another. What if we loved all of the family of God? What if instead of holding a record of wrong, like 1 Corinthians 13 says we are not supposed to do. We were quick to forgive. We were quick to understand that we all don't always have to agree on every single thing in order to live in a loving relationship. In this fourth chapter of 1 John, we are told time and time again we are to love one another. And John is writing this to the church. John is saying, church, family of God, you should love one another. In fact, if you go back to verse, or chapter 3 and verse 16, he says that the body of Christ, we need to be willing to lay down our lives for one another. What if we loved all of the family of God? What if we saw other churches in our communities not as competition in the kingdom of God, but partners in the work of the kingdom? What if we loved all of the family of God? What if instead of judging them, we simply extended love and grace to them? So another rhetorical kind of question for you to wrestle with, what will you do this season or in 2021 to love your church family better? 
family of God, across our city, across our county? What will you do to love them better? One of the things that we're doing today is giving in a special offering. We want to love the family of God better. We want to bless our Church of God missionaries. We want to bless our ministry partners here in town like Christian Cooper. What are we going to do this season and in 2021 to love the family of God better? So third way that we can live this call to love all out. What if you and I love the people on the margins of life? What if you and I love all the people on the margins of life? The margins of life is intricately woven throughout all of the Christmas story. In fact, if the Christmas story is about anything, it is about how God comes to the forgotten, to the outcast, to the broken, to the unworthy. We've talked about that over the last few weeks together. So especially at Christmas, one of the things that should distinguish Christ followers from the world is a love that reaches out to the marginalized and the forgotten. Again, as I said earlier, sometimes it seems like those outside of the faith do a far better job of practicing this than the church does. And that's a shame. What are we as a church doing? What are you as an individual follower of Christ doing to care for those who are on the outside of the community? In Jesus' earthly ministry, as he grew and entered into that season of ministry, we see time and time again in scriptures that Jesus cares for those who are on the outside. As followers of Christ, we're called to do the same. To lavishly love the poor, the hurting, the, the broken, the lonely. There are people in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our cities, and around the world that desperately need to know the love of God in us. In chapter 3 of 1 John, there are some words that I find incredibly challenging, incredibly powerful. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 3. John is talking throughout his letter to the church about how we are to love. And he says this, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? If we don't care for those who are on the margins, how can the love of God be inside of us? Then he says this in verse 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth, how are we tangibly living out the love of God for those who are on the margins? And not just those on the margins, how are we tangibly living out the love of Christ in our family, in our church family, in the family of God? Matthew chapter 25, Jesus teaches the parable. He says that as often as you do these things to the least of these, you've done it unto me. How are we reaching out this season to those who are on the outside? Christmas is our chance to move closer to those who are in need, those who are in crisis, and not move away from them. That's what God's call for us is. St. Augustine, a saint from centuries ago, says this, What does love look like? It has hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and to the needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. Because that is what Christ did. Simple yes or no question. Again, you don't have to answer this out loud. But do you know someone today who is in need? Someone who you can help meet? That need. And there are a variety of ways that you could do that. Our folks who have been out caroling, they were meeting a need in one way. There were those who went out this past week and dropped off cookies. There were others who dropped off fruit to people here in the church who were in need. There are ways that we can tangibly express that. Do you know someone in need today? How do you know? Lastly, and in some ways perhaps more important than all the others, we're called to love all. Will you love those who are outside the faith? The good news of the gospel, the good news of Christmas, is that it is good news for all. The message that the angel gave to the shepherds is, I bring to you good news of great joy for all the people. 
Do you and I love enough that we will share the gospel with someone? Do you and I love enough that we will share the gospel with someone? The shepherds did. They came to the stable when they had seen everything that the angel had proclaimed. They went their way sharing with everyone that they came in contact with. Paul says it this way, for Christ's love compels us. Does the love of Christ this Christmas season, does the love of Christ in your life compel you to share the good news of the gospel with those who are outside the faith? We are called to love all. And that love sometimes must be offered and extended in the face of resistance, in the face of opposition, in the face of persecution. Will we love all? So last questions for us today. Who will you share intensely? Set out to share the good news of Jesus with this Christmas. Who will you intensely share the good news of Jesus with this Christmas? And will you even now be praying and asking God to open a door that you can share? the good news of Jesus. Well, that's for you folks online as well. Who is God laying on your heart? Who do you know who needs to know the hope that is found in Jesus Christ? So would you just bow your head with me this morning? Just want you to ponder these things. Is so there someone in your family today this coming week that needs an extra dose of First Corinthians kind of love, patience, kindness. Someone who needs to be forgiven of wrongs done. Someone who you need to listen well to, offer grace to. Is there someone today that you can think of as your head is bowed that just needs a tangible expression of the Lord God? Maybe it's through simple things like hospitality. Maybe you can invite them to join you in worship on Christmas Eve. Maybe you can invite them to join with you in watching online, either in your home or through a watch party. This morning, would you think and ponder of ways that you could look around, not only the life of the church, but here in our community, and discover ways that you could serve others? Would you allow God's Spirit to work that in your heart today? You're willing to make that commitment while your head is still bowed. Would you just raise a hand and simply say, Pastor Todd, that's me. I am willing to commit today to loving all, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your church family, whether it's in the world. If that's you, just raise your hand. Pastor Todd, I'll make a fresh commitment today to love all. Just slip that hand up back down. Trust that's your heart. Father, as we close this think about all that you have done and provided for us in Christ, all that we have journeyed with in this Advent season. God, let these things not just shape us for the month of December, but let these things shape every day of our life because we are called to walk in the light of Christ. We are called to be living expressions of his love, your love for us. And every day you give to us and in every circumstance and relationship. God, I want to pray a special prayer over this offering that we take here on this last Sunday of Advent. God, I want to pray for Christian Covering, an aid organization in our city where we have the opportunity to serve and support them in a special way this Christmas season. God, would you bless them as they care for people who are hurting, who are broken, who do not have much to feed in their family. God, would you bless them and use them to care for our city, and would you help us to partner with them not only this season, but each month of the year. God, I pray for our Church of God missionaries, many of whom have struggled to have received income to support them on the mission field because of this pandemic season. 
God, would you surround them today? Would you use our offering to be a blessing to them here at the close of this year? Would you remind them that you still love them and you are with them, that you care for them or are providing for them? Lord, bless this offering. Lord, as we go from this place, Lord, may we go with that fresh commitment to love all of our family. To love all of the family of God, to love those who are on the margins of life. And Lord, especially to show your love to those who are outside of your family. For it is for that reason that you came. Not just so that we can have pretty twinkling lights in the tree, not just so that we can have presents that we unwrap on Christmas Day but so that we might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and an eternal quality of life because you live in our hearts. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for this day, for our time together. May we go from this place to honor you and help you the same. We ask these things in your name. Go in the grace, the mercy, and the peace of Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us today.